Before we get started with this podcast, the team at Working Preacher would like to welcome you to the first week of our fall fundraising campaign. All gifts made during the fall campaign will be doubled with a dollar for dollar match up to $10,000. When you make a gift during the fall campaign, October 1st through the 31st, we will send you a free ebook titled Digital Jazz, Media and Technology for Preaching. Working Preacher would not be possible without generous donors like you, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you. You can make your gift online today at workingpreacher.org. Thank you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the 18th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 9, 2022, are from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, 7 through 15c. The semi-continuous first reading is Jeremiah 21, verse 1, and then 4 through 7. We have Psalm 111, 2 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, and Luke 17, 11 through 19. These are fun days for people who are working through Luke's gospel, I think. Great texts coming up. Uh, a string of them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, as the travel narrative starts to come to an end. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are. And this story, I think, is, is, is sort of a story that People, I I think, connect with Luke for a number of different reasons, a lot of the themes. I really appreciated the commentary of of that focus on borderlands and that Mm -hmm. sort of the ambiguity of where Jesus actually is, uh, that he's going through the region between Samaria and Galilee. And so I think one homiletical direction could just kind of explore that, that, that space that Luke's Jesus really sits in, right, of the of the expected uh, Galilean or even Judean Messiah, yet that the one who uh, finds himself uh, in Samaria, but uh, the one who uh, comes for all flesh. And so I, I love that ambiguity of this story. Also, the ambiguity of, well, so which temple are they to show themselves to when they go to the priests? You know, are we talking about Jerusalem? Are we talking about Mount Gerizim and the temple of Mount Gerizim for the Samaritans? We don't know. There's so much we don't know on the front end, which just invites a lot of, uh, exposes a lot of our assumptions of who Jesus is there to heal or who Jesus is willing to heal. And what do we, yeah, what do we expect uh, that the directions are and where do we imagine Jesus to be and what does it mean to follow a Jesus who exists in that uh, that in-between space uh, where decisions have to be made and uh, and assumptions have to be challenged and expectations have to be acknowledged. So that's my first thought about this text. Along line, uh, along the same lines, is that I appreciate the uh, 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 our pausing here because this text opens up, actually gives an opportunity to highlight again how Luke does that back and forth of bringing in um, participants that we wouldn't ordinarily identify as those um, that are supposed to be in this story when we we think of the way that um, we've kind of narrowly read it. And so uh, using this opening um, through the region um, so that that ambiguity that you've already mentioned um, also reminds us of all of the different persons. So Luke starting with shepherds as opposed to kings and including the named and the unnamed, the, um, the, the folks with privilege, the folks with money, the people without privilege, the people uh, who would be considered poor. And so I think that this text allows that kind of overview of who uh, Jesus is encountering uh, in this gospel as well. Yeah, the people themselves are on the borderlands between life and death in a lot of ways from the perspective of people then. Uh, one of the 
one of the things about what the Bible calls leprosy, which we know is not the same thing as what modern physicians would call leprosy, some, some kind of a skin disease, is it appears to have made their skin look like a corpse's skin. And this is part of the problem is they, they look like dead corpses walking around and nothing defiles like death defiles from a Jewish point of view. And so they live in this state of, of perpetual ritual impurity, which requires then this, you know, this regular, like it does for most people back then who become impure through a variety of contacts or things that happen in one's body. Uh, but they're, they kind of exist really very much in that, in that netherworld between can you worship, can you not worship, where can you worship, where can you not worship? Mm -hmm. Um, so to bring that in as well, too, like, what does it mean to live as though you were dead or that people saw you as this living reminder or maybe a walking reminder of death? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are we saying that zombies is um, in the Bible original, the beta version of all of our zombie ideology? Uh, there's no evidence they're eating brains. But. Okay. I'm, I'm actually liking this version better than the modern version. <laughs> yes, actually, The Walking Dead is based on this story. It's a it's an unknown fact as we come to the, there you go. the last season of The Walking Dead. They're going to reveal that actually the inspiration was the story. <laughs> and once again, a biblical imagination is shaping the best storytelling all around. There you, go. there you go. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said earlier. Uh, I think it was Caroline about the, the way the story might expose some assumptions that we might make about who these people are. Like, should we be shocked that a, a Samaritan with the skin disease is hanging out with Galileans with this skin disease? Probably not, mm. but we sometimes are. Uh, the whole mention of going to the priest, there's so, there's such a long line of interpretation of this story that suggests that Jesus is somehow trying to one up the priest or that this is a kind of Jesus versus the establishment story. And it's, I don't think it is personally, yeah. it's not Jesus versus the temple or Jesus versus the priesthood. There's no reason to expect the priest would not be happy to see lepers show up. People with the skin disease show up now, now purified and, and healed. So we want to be careful of that too. I think that we don't, we don't um, kind of overstate the the exclusion of the vitriol these people might have experienced um, as, as well, because then also we just ignore we we miss the way it's a story about gratitude. I think, mm. and maybe gratitude from an unlikely place, but gratitude nevertheless. Or maybe simply, uh, I I really I really appreciate that uh, Matt and. On two levels, um, one is a reminder that I'll probably say a lot uh, na this week is uh, that we need to remember to tell the story for those who don't know it or haven't heard it. Um, and the way that you just brought that in in some ways is to tell it in a way that for those of us who think we know it realize maybe we've put some things in it that aren't really there. And uh, so that's that's one. And then the other, uh, leaning in on this idea of, uh, of gratitude, which for me is often the way that this text has been approached. Uh, who says thank you? Uh, and on, on one level, I, I want to shift it away and say, how do we say thank you? There's an awe, and I've said this before on the podcast, there's an awe for us when we ask something of God and then God does it. And it's kind of amazing because what you want to say is, didn't we ask because we thought God would do it? And then we're amazed because our request is granted. Uh, but then in that amazement, do we pause to worship? And, and that's the language I want to use. Do we pause to acknowledge God for what God has done? And uh, in this text, one way of presenting that would be that Jesus is saying, uh, go to the, to the temple, the place where God shows up, and acknowledge what has been done for you, to you, in you. Um, and then that praise becomes the work of the Spirit through you. 
Yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, I think that all all of those uh, points are important. Going back to Matt's comment about the, the way in which the show yourselves to the priests has been interpreted over the years. I think one thing that we want to pay attention to is the, yes, this is not Jesus competing against or one upping his religious system. And maybe the clue there is, and as they went, they were made clean that that part of part of the healing is this uh is this realization of the continuity of Jesus and uh the of Israel and Jesus or Judaism and Jesus or Jesus is a Jew but you know what i mean that there's mm-hmm. Jesus is not over and against but there's a sort of uh the way in which as they went they were made clean that that healing can't happen without a connection to uh, the ways in which we understand and recognize God's activity in the world. And so I think maybe that's one thing we want to, where is there a, not, not maybe not necessarily a reciprocity, but where is there, I guess the word is continuity be, between mm-hmm. what Jesus is, what Jesus is doing and what people know of how God works in the world. And so, yeah, Jesus is again is not one upping that, but working within it (laughs) uh, to, uh, to transform it. The thing about thanking him too, I think the way in which we have the, the link between worship and gratitude Mm -hmm. and worship is so, and praise and worship is such a, and, and praise is such an important theme in, in Luke, but the way in which maybe a preacher could help people think about what, what is the connection between gratitude and worship? Uh, What is that a way to think about worship? And while the NRSV translation, he prostrated some of Jesus' feet and thanked him. Uh, it's actually better translated. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet, thanking him, because it's a masculine nominative singular participle. And so, and it's a present tense participle. So he's thanking him. This is not like, thanks, Jesus, and moving, moving, moving on your way, but that, 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 the, the response is a constant thinking, a constant state of gratitude it's for the way in which, yeah, the way, the way of being for the way in which God enters into our lives for, with healing and wholeness. So those are some of the details of the text too, that I think can unpack a little bit more of the themes that we're lifting up. Mm-hmm. Gratitude is one of those things that church is really, or should be really good at in terms of teaching people that gratitude toward God is the right response to certain events in life or to certain things. Not that other institutions can't do that, but people of faith can do that in a particular way that we don't always have a lot of models for in the culture. Um, Sometimes gratitude is is perceived as weakness in some ways, you know, Mm. I did that. (laughs) Uh, But to talk about what that looks like. That's also, I think, worth exploring that as we keep talking about what's the church's distinctive mission in a world that's got more problems in it than we know how to even begin some days, that part mm-hmm. of it is is this, this habituation in what gratitude toward God looks like and how and when and where we express that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good. Should we move on? Another story about, about skin disease, but a really different one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and you know, part of we make fun of these pairings sometimes. Like, look, look, there's more than one story. But this is something too to remember that Jesus is not the first person in Scripture who's credited with delivering people from these kinds of skin diseases. Moses, as well, I believe, in his prayer for Miriam and then uh, Elisha in this case. So, from the perspective of of the Gospels and the contemporaries of Jesus, part of what's going on with his healings is oh my goodness, this guy looks like two of the greatest prophets in our history. That mm-hmm. uh, It's another way that kind of helps them reckon with just how extraordinary this person is in their lives. Mm-hmm. And, and along in that with um, what Caroline said earlier in terms of, and, and, and you were saying it as well, Matt, this continuity with um, uh, what God has always been doing. 
Um, so this story unfolds in a similar way. Um, and let me put it this way. This episode uh, um, unfolds in a similar way in that um, the one in need of healing is sent to the space where they will know that this is the God of Israel that is responsible. And that's what the temple is in the, in the New Testament passage. Um, and the prophet is in this Old Testament passage. And so I think that um, similarity of focus is also something worth paying attention to. You know, I like to, to, to echo the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, whenever I do a text. And I think this is a perfect example of being able to see very clearly, uh, as you've just mentioned, Matt, that this is the same thing that's always been going on. And, uh, and it would be worthwhile to communicate that in our messages. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even the gratitude as well, mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that it, there's more to the story beyond verse 15 that could be interesting to play with for a little bit, but that that uh, Naaman is, is eager to show gratitude and Naaman is eager to bring some of the earth of Israel back to Syria with him, that there's the, the, the change or the transformation is more than just um, a change in his skin condition, for example. Yeah. And I think, you know, going back to the obvious, which like, okay, what am I supposed to preach on skin diseases or, you know, <laughs> but, but there's, um, there's something really interesting about that too, in the ways in which one could be judged or one could be, they're, they're observable diseases in terms of w w with what people suffer that uh, they're not inside the body, uh, but they're outside of the body. And, uh, and the way in which maybe we particularize that a little bit, uh, that, 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 you know, that ostracization or that ritual uncleanliness, uh, the, the manifold levels of that because of the observable disease that would, uh, that would cause one to pull away or um, move away uh, as opposed to something that's inside. And I find that to be, I find that to be really interesting in terms of, you know, your, your faith has saved you or the way in which you have been made whole or healing that, uh, that, that truly that fleshly healing, but also as you were just saying, Matt, that inside uh, that, inside spiritual healing as well. So there's like a whole body reality in these texts that I find really, I find also uh, homiletically appealing <laughs> uh, as we think about, as we think about the specificity of these particular diseases. And, and one could make also the connection back to uh, Jesus opening sermon in Luke where Naaman is re referenced. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, uh, and again, making your comment joy of that connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament that Je Jesus even references this story, mm -hmm. uh, of course, in his vision of why he came and what his mission is about. And so it's the widow of Zarephath and Naaman, the Syrian king. And of course, the result of that is, well, let's throw him off a cliff. Uh, so there's um, something there, too, that I think a preacher could go with. I like this um, uh, a transformation, uh, just the word um, Matt has given us partly because a lot of times in our culture, what we look for is the outward manifestation. Um, I'm from Chicago and I often say, you know, people in Chicago pray for parking spaces. And if you get one, God's on the move, right? Um, we often will pray for healing and we want that kind of physical transformation. Um, but what the world has often called the followers of Christ to accountability for is that we might be able to say there's money in our bank account or we've got the promotion or we got the parking place or we've been healed. But what they don't see 
is the hospitality. What they don't see is the community. What they don't see is the transformation of how we interact with one another. And these texts tell stories of folks that are supposed to be outside of the line of where we extend hospitality. And I think that transformation of the heart and transfer transformation of our behavior is really critical uh, for us to begin to highlight uh, for our congregation. In what ways does this give an example that if God shows up and shows out in your life, the change is not not just that you can say you've been healed, but that folks can see that there's something dramatically different about you that is practicing that hospitality that the world is longing for, where everyone seems to be at division with one another. Yeah, yeah the connection between hospitality and and uh, and Thanksgiving, I think, is really key, Joy. Mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. it, it makes us it makes me wish we could follow Naaman and follow the Samaritan further down in their stories. <clears throat> but, uh, but I think you're right that that's, that Thanksgiving is more than just a sense of gratitude, but it gets lived out. And some of the ways it gets lived out is to break down some of those same barriers that we see mm -hmm. getting rearranged in these stories. Yeah. Yeah. Not often I say this, but here's a, a passage from Jeremiah that I really like, <laughs> but it makes me feel good. How about that? <laughs> okay. Which is unusual for Jeremiah. That's yeah. not usually Jeremiah's uh, task and, Prophetic is not to cheer me up, right? No, it is prophetic mission. <laughs> In context, though, this is a hard text. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we read around the texts that are not listed, you know, verse one, verse four through seven, uh, this is right before that wonderful text, you know, for I know the plans in, in, in verse 11. Um, but the challenge of this text is it's a call to live in the moment of despair and um, loss with the hope of what God is yet to do. Mm -hmm. And we often love that uh, 2911 text to be able to say, you know, this is the promise. But this text right here says, before that promise is fulfilled, you're going to live as if that hope is real, um, uh, a hope not yet seen. Yeah. yeah, it's an admission of defeat or maybe better an admission that there's no quick fix here. Mm -hmm. If fix is back to normal, which in some ways we've lived through that uh, in, a, in a pandemic way, but really different. But right, right. It's just, I, I think the passage is such a, a beautiful way of, of imaging or illustrating what a life of faith looks like. Absolutely. Uh, embrace the disappointment. <laughs> There's no immediate deliverance, but guess what? God is here. And in this place that looks like a foreign land, right? A foreign culture or foreign values. Nevertheless, God is going to show up here and become well, incarnate. It's not quite the right word, but manifested through the life of community and your pursuits is a kind of good news that's, um, well, again, it's just, it, you, there's only, only people of faith really talk like this in mm -hmm. my experience mm -hmm. and how we give voice to that in the midst of so much disappointment and not just disappointment in the sense of all the individual stories we carry, but just the overwhelming burden of disappointment that so many churches feel about lack of influence and, and ways in which the world is not perhaps on the direction you want it to be and so on. Mm -hmm. And, and I, yes, yes, yes. And yes, of everything that you all just, you, both of you just said, and the way in which too, that uh, particularly like verse five, that plant gardens and eat what they produce, just that, that, promise of production and promise of uh, that things will come to fruition. We're not sure when or in what capacity, but it still will happen. And how do you, how do you live with that kind of uh, promise? And, and I think uh, that, that living in the moment too might be, might be a way for a preacher to 
kind of unpack that even more. That's so much about, and I don't want to get, I wouldn't want to get too overly philosophical or spiritualized or like secularized about that. Live in the moment and, you know, the ways that you can live in the moment. But how do you theologize that? That would be the task of the preacher. How do you, you know, because how do you, you know, the little memes that you see or the little plaques that, you know, live in the moment and how do we practice living in the moment? And it's important to live in the moment and live in the present, but how then particularly does this text uh, give preachers the language to theologize what that means? Uh, and, and that, that, that your present is a, it, it is the presence of God. And uh, that's a, that's a different kind of perspective or a call to living in the moment uh, that, that we need to be able to identify. If I thread this from um, creation uh, through the words of Christ, and uh, it, one way of looking at this is this is exactly what was the first task of the first couple in the garden, um, that there is enough for everyone, including the animals. So what is produced by the plants in the garden is sufficient. And then you have that same promise uh, through the wilderness when Moses has is saying, your daily bread will be supplied. And that I'm, I'm using that language because I wanna pull it through. That's what the prayer is. Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, this is a God who knows to, uh, what enough is. And in the midst of the abundance that is promised for us, that abundance is sufficient. It's not abundance for waste. It's sufficiency. And uh, I, so I, 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 I like that thread that can be pulled through all of, of the scriptures in verse five. And um, again, I'm going to push that challenge in verse seven. Um, to seek the welfare of the circumstance of those in the circumstances where you are, not to pray pray for their demise, but to pray for their success, because if they succeed, their welfare is your welfare. Um, and in a polarized community that we're living in right now, I think that's an important word that God is supplying sufficiently for us. And it's not uh, us against them. And so we can pray for their welfare because that will be our benefit. Uh, I, I think that's a hard word, um, but I also think it's a hopeful word that invites us to display hospitality, even when we feel like we're living in the midst of hurt. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. And it calls yeah. us back to proximity, right? You want to know where you're called to serve, where you are mm -hmm. right now. Yeah. I think uh, the psalm is, given everything that we've talked about, the psalm is gives wonderful Im, Im, imagery, but but also language, particularly vocabulary for what we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So the way in which you can bring the psalm in, and you know, he provides food for those who fear him, is ever mindful of his covenant. This is what it means to be, what you were talking about, joy. What it means to be in a covenant with God is this provision. And, uh, but a covenant that also calls us to a certain way of, of loving the neighbor and being among the neighbor. And so the way in which you can maybe make those connections using the Psalm would be my suggestion of what to do with the Psalm this week. Notice that I didn't say use it liturgically, although you could, <laughs> but it really does give us wonderful, I think, as I said, vocabulary for uh, to take the time to weave together the lines from the psalm yeah. to tell whatever episode you're, you're using, whether you're using the Old Testament or, or the New Testament, in a way like we would drop a line from a song, a contemporary song that kind of has currency because we know that tune. Um, that's what the psalms can be um, so that those one liners help us to remember the episodes, whether it's uh, the story of uh, Jesus's story in Luke, or it's the a rehearsal of the story uh, of Naaman. Yeah. And then finally, Second Timothy. This is our second reading in a series of readings of, of Second Timothy, and so we want to say a couple words about that. 
it's a nice reminder of how Paul was remembered in the early church, that Paul was mostly remembered, at least in those earliest decades or centuries, not so much as a great thinker or as a great theologian, but as somebody whose pattern of life needed to be um, imitated. And so in this case, it's suffering hardship and then also right, uh, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly explaining the word of truth. It's this idea of this person who's imprisoned still <laughs> saying, my job is to work uh, and continue to do what I'm doing, doing the things that got me here. So, you know, I, I don't want to just preach that, but it's a helpful reminder that the image of Paul that comes out of the New Testament from all of its sources and all of its messiness is somebody who also tries to put a theology into practice and that we're not just turning to Paul for head knowledge. Two pieces I read in this text that I had not read before reading them alongside the lectionary as pointed as I did this time. And and one is uh, that, that verse 15 that's one of my favorite. Um, but when you think about the leper going to the temple, don't be ashamed. Becomes a different. It became a different reading for me. Uh, do yourself. Uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved by Him, as one healed by Him, as one made whole by Him, as one who does not need to be ashamed. Um, and it draws back the attention that uh, Caroline noted for us is that the healing didn't take place before they left Jesus to go to the priest. The healing happened as. So this text actually becomes a way of, of, of highlighting that to present yourself as one approved, um, not ashamed, even though the status that you take that first step may not be the status of full wholeness. And the other portion of that that I think is similar to that is if we are faithless, he remains faithful. And in that one, you can tie that to the story of Naaman, which is a story of someone who has this attitude and um, isn't trusting, isn't understanding the God who is capable and going to uh, bring healing. God is faithful, even when we are not. So th those two lines um, become a way to use the language that Caroline used with the psalm to give language for the episodes in the other text. Just another way to use that. Yeah, great connections. <laughs>